Okay, we, uh, why don't we get, go ahead and get started. Um, we have a quorum, so go ahead and roll, Senator Lowenthal, Senator Hancock, Senator Runner, Assemblymember Browning, Assemblymember Buchanan, Assemblymember Hagman, Esteban Almanza, Here. Kathleen Moore, Nadja Dobby, Pedro Reyes. Present. We have quorum. Thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. Are there any public comments at this point? Okay. Um, mo minutes. Is there a motion of the minutes? Move and second. Uh, do we take roll call or can we be unanimous? Unanimous without objections, unanimous. Thank you. Any public comment at this point? I know that uh, Mark Ryan, Dr. Mark Ryan, wanted to make a comment, or is it later? This is the time for public comment, and then we have other opportunities as well. So it's up to you, sir. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Mark Ryan. I'm the superintendent of the Oakland Military Institute, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to publicly thank the staff of both the California School Finance Authority and the Office of Public School Construction who have been really incredible in the process of our school trying to go through the very cumbersome process of trying to get these uh, these funds and uh, in particular Barbara Kempminer and Jason Casillas at OPSC as well as um, the folks at the California School Finance Authority have just been amazing so I just wanted to publicly thank them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Are we ready? Okay, let's go. Count three. Uh, the Executive Officer that we actually have six things to share with you tonight. Um, definitely excited that we actually have some great news to report to you. There was a lot of discussion at the last board about whether or not we're going to have a bond sale. They, the Treasurer's Office did execute a bond sale on October 19th, which is approximately $1 billion will be allocated to this program. And so to highlight, um, the goal is, and, and actually staff will be, bringing back a portion that's in December. And so it's really critical that um, we have a full presence, if we can, uh, staff set full presence in December so we can activate those projects that came in for priorities of funding. And again, just to remind the board, we actually did receive over $1.3 billion in certifications from 187 school districts, which represents over 504 projects. Accordingly, 306 modernization, 136 in new construction, and 62 projects and additional programs. And again, those are the projects that will be appropriated the money, depending on bond source. So okay. staff will be diligent working on that. The second item is uh, facility hardship and rehabilitation apportionments. At the last meeting, uh, a nice dialogue of whether or not we had extra cash to provide apportionments to projects on on the unfunded list and we did some cash to make available to at least five projects that were facility hardship which are your health and safety there are part of your consent agenda that and those apportionments will equal over 1.7 million dollars the next item is the annual deferred maintenance program apportionments um, also in your consent agenda there's 255.1 million dollars that represents deferred maintenance program apportionments for fiscal year 2010-11 and again the purpose of those funds was to, to uh, re do major repairs on existing school facilities that also may include uh, electrical system, air conditioning, heating, roofing and plumbing but with the enactment of SBX 3-4 um, those funds could be used for any educational purposes through 2015 and 16. The next item is uh, the third career tech funding cycle, um, we actually had some projects that uh, unfortunately didn't move forward, so we had excess bond authority in the career tech educational program. So with that, staff is presenting some unfunded approvals in the consent agenda. There's 23 projects totaling $33 million that are part of the consent agenda. The fifth item is the solar hearing update. Um, we are still working on uh, coordinating a meeting. There was. Um, an interest by Senator Hancock to have a hearing and so we are coming together and it looks like we we're trying to finalize the meeting for December 5th so we will have an opportunity to present something and again we'll be sending out invites and uh, publicly noticing that meeting. Mm -hmm. The last item is we have been doing some updates to our website. Um, we do have an events calendar and you can actually sync that events calendar to your uh, PDA. So if it, 
That would be a nice feature um, if you want to keep track with OPSC and its current events. Thank you. And probably one of the most current events that's happened in OPSC is the addition of Bill Savage to your right. Yes. As a member of the uh, board staff. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Your first meeting. Thank you. Everybody will get a chance to work with Bill, particularly those folks working on the implementation committee. But he's also one of the go-to people. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Moore, you want to make a comment? Um, well, first, I really want to thank the treasurer and the administration on the bond sale. I think that's um, incredible for our for our projects and for the state of California. So I just want to make sure it's registered that we are that uh, we're very thankful for that. Um, and I just had a question, Lisa, on the on the facility hardship. Are those projects required to do 90 days, or are they do they have 18 months to get their projects moved? They actually have 90 days to come there. So they'll all be, the, those five projects will also be moving forward immediately. That's right. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, so for the December date, December 14th, we're going to be dealing with a lot of money, so I really encourage folks to be here for that. And I believe that also on the December 14th date is when we're going to have the training from the Bagley Keene from the Department of Justice folks that Ms. Moore was very kind to point out to us uh, on that presentation. Um, so just encourage folks to see if they can make it. Thank you. Okay, any comments? All right. Tap four, consent agenda. Uh, there are several items. So just so we know, we're all on the same page. The Sentinella appeal was postponed as was the San Jose uh, issue was also postponed. East Side Union. And East Side Union was also postponed. So a very hectic agenda was uh, reduced today. Um, so we will, we have but we granted those postponements. Okay? And then on the consent, there are several action items in the back. Uh, tab 7, 14, and 15 are non-controversial items, and unless there's any objection, I'd like to have those included when we move the consent item. 7, 14, and 15. I move the, the consent agenda with those items, items 7, 14, and 15. Yes. Thank you. And I, Not it? I just need to abstain from three items on um, item 14. The okay. LAUSD Camino Nuevo, which is on page 302, LAUSD College Ready Academy, which is on page 303, and LAUSD College Ready Academy number 8, on page 303. Okay. So let's hold off then on consent on 14 so that we can report unanimous consent on, okay, it's been moved by Ms. Brownlee. <laughs> Motion to um, move the consent agenda, including items 7 and 14. And 15. And 15, excuse 15. me. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. And I just have, I will abstain from the Elk Grove items on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Otherwise, we'll re report that as unanimous. And then now to 14, we'll bifurcate that, and we will, oh, yes, we, well, without objection, to be unanimous, okay. Okay, all right, and then on item 14, we'll bifurcate that and uh, and pull the Camino Nuevo, page 302, the College Ready Academy High, number 19, page 303, attachment B, and the College Ready Academy High, number eight on page three, three attached and B. We will take the rest of tab 14. So moved. It has been moved in second. Without objection, it would be unanimous. And then if we can take a motion on the remaining three items. So move in second. And Nadia will abstain. And everybody else voting aye? Excellent. We would figure this one out. I knew that. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any public comment at this point? I have a tendency to forget that. Okay. Tap five. Five is um, 
basically our report to the board of how we are liquidating our funds. Um, we actually had minimal activity this month. Uh, if I can direct your attention to page 172, out of all the bond apportionments or the bond funds we had um, via the bond sales since 2009, we only liquidated $7.7 .7 million um, in funds this month. So with that, again, very little activity. Um, what has been released are really those projects that are that have timelines, and so we're we're encouraging those projects to come in, and we're happy to see that there are some movement in the funds. So so that's great. Um, we still have on page 173, we actually still have about 216 million dollars that's in our accounts currently, and a lot of that those funds are related to a graph we have illustrated on page 173 which we're keeping, or 174, I apologize, we're keeping track of the projects that had an 18-month timeline, and those are the last of the, most of the projects that were received apportionments back in April 2010 that actually had, again, the old requirements of coming in in 18 months. Which will result in, um, time limit on fund release uh, being activated and this bond authority would go back to the program. So with that, I'll open to any questions. Any questions, any public comment? Okay, moving on to the next tab, six. Tab six is the status of fund releases. Um, actually had a pretty heavy month this month. Um, in Proposition 1D, we actually activated um, over 63 projects, a good portion of the activity represented mod modernization. We actually provided 141.8 million, which represents 56 projects that we processed this month. And we actually have a high performance project that was processed, five of those, and um, a charter school apportionment that's actually reflected in the, in the account. And so for 140.3 million net um, activity this month, that represents 63 projects in Proposition 1D. And in Proposition 55, uh, 30.5 million in new construction, and that represents 14 projects we process. We had uh, no activity in Proposition 47 to report, but in total for the school facilities program, we had over 77 projects that we processed this month for over $170.8 million. So pretty large activity this month. Right. Thank you. Any questions? questions? Any comments from the public? Okay, there are none. <laughs> okay, tab seven was on consent. Tab eight was been withdrawn. Tab nine. Tab nine. Are we on tab nine? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Sharp with the Office of Public School Construction, and I'm presenting the district request from Los Angeles Unified School District. In this appeal, the district is requesting an overcrowded relief grant unfunded approval, which includes additional site development costs for methane mitigation. The district submitted a, a funding application on October 29, 2010, as part of the seventh round of the overcrowded relief grant funding, funding round. During the review, staff determined that it was not eligible to receive uh, site development allowance for methane mitigation costs. Costs were disallowed because the remediation is not specifically allowed in school facility program regulations. Therefore, administrative resolution wasn't possible on this item. Staff supports the district's request. While the methane mitigation is not specifically allowed in a category of site development, it is within the board's authority to approve these costs as reasonable and appropriate site development work. The section of SFP regulation 1859.76 specifically states that the board will approve reasonable and appropriate site development work which meets common engineering practices and industry standards that are consistent. I move to approve. Okay, <laughs> we do have one second piece of this, <laughs> um, and considering that uh, attachment C then, I'm assuming, is approved, that's the, the district's the funding for this item. The second piece is moving forward. 
uh, request that the board give direction to staff as to whether or not clarifying regulations for these instances should be created or if these should be returned on a case-by-case -case basis to the board for consideration. Okay. We'll, we'll bifurcate the issue. Let's deal with the financing first. Ms. Moore, do you have a question or comment? Okay, so let's go with the fi financing first. Okay. It's been moved and second. All in favor? Okay. Unanimous, without objection. The second issue then is the regulation moving forward. Mr. Cannon. I would prefer we continue to handle it on a case-by-case -case basis because it's such an unusual circumstance. I don't. I fear we'd get into the same kind of seismic. We we try and come up with a one-size-fits-all, and it really is an issue that comes up that's very unique to, to each situation. I'm here. I'm seeing a lot of nods. Okay, without well, Mr. We'll second. I'll second that. Agman. So. So right now we do nothing. We just go continue in a case by case. So let's just do nothing and continue in a case by case, and that would be the direction of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item ten was pulled. Item eleven was pulled. Item twelve was pulled. Item thirteen, North Monterey. So. I direct your attention to tab 13, uh, stamp page 263. Staff is presenting the district's request to allow basically a fund switch um, from Proposition 47 to Proposition 1D um, because Proposition 1D doesn't have a labor compliance program. The project received a new construction apportionment in April 2010 from Proposition 47. The project was awarded the cash based on the 18 month statutory timeline that the board was following at that point in time. And that statutory timeline ends this Friday, which is October 28, 2011. The project was completed and unoccupied on October 10, 2009. The new construction application cannot be resubmitted or after, after occupancy. Historically, OPSC attempts to assign bond funds to projects based on whether or not they have implemented and enforced a labor compliance program. A labor compliance program is required for projects receiving funding out of Proposition 47 and 55. The labor compliance program must be approved by the Department of Industrial Relations. Um, specifically, labor code states that in part, LCP means a labor compliance program that is approved again by Department of Industrial Relations. So um, I'll just break it down for you. <laughs> the crux of the issue is that the district unfortunately didn't have a labor compliance program um, in place for the project and they're asking for board approval to switch fund sources at this point in time. So there's three options that we had laid out for you on stamp page 267, 268, 269. 267, the first option would be the project would receive a reduced funding which represents um, at the time, we had only had found only uh, Proposition 1A and Proposition 1D available um, for the project. And that option or the uh, mechanics of the uh, calculation would be as follows, which is on page 269. Uh, we would find existing bond authority in Proposition 1A over $900,000 to be available. Proposition 1D, uh, nearly $70,000 to be available. That in total would be over a million dollars that would be allocated potentially to the project if the board decided to switch uh, bond authorities. And so with that, uh, North Monterey's project is over $1.47 million and they would technically receive uh, a reduction in the project. Uh, the second option, or option 1B, that we actually laid out uh, late last night is we actually did find some projects on the unfunded list um, who actually have a Proposition 1D allocation and those two districts are Alpaw and Monterey County Office of Education in which they say they have a labor compliance program in place um, and they're willing to switch bond source from Proposition 1D to um, Prop 47. And likewise, that, those particular funds would be available for this project, so we would be transferring in effect $667,000 and 735000 collectively. So in total, we would have over $2.4 million in bond authority to switch for uh, the North Monterey uh, project. And so that's uh, the other option for the board. And the last option for the board is whether or not to deny the district's appeal. So with that, I'll open up to any questions. Mr. Hagman, just want to make sure I understand it. So if you go with 1B, 
you're not going to be using the full 2.4 million on this, just the, the amount that had already been approved for, right? Right. That's and so the other projects will still be fully funded, this will be fully funded, just basically moving the cans around to figure out who gets paid with what. That's correct. And we went through this in a few meetings back with a couple other issues. Are we fairly confident that this is one of the last ones we're going to come up with this? Have we done any more inspections or anything that we go out and visit these sites? Because there's not that much more flexibility this board has to change bond funds around. It's up to the school district to communicate with us as far as whether or not they have a labor compliance program. One of the checks that we do is institute right now is, as far as trying to prevent material inaccuracies is they have to provide us validation at the time of fund release that they have a labor compliance program. So we were doing preventative measures to prevent material inaccuracies so we wouldn't release the funds, but at this point in time, this is all that we know. And for this particular school district, we had uh, authority or we had a sign off when they got funded that they had this, but That's then they didn't correct. use it. That's correct. Is the school district here to testify at all to that? Yeah, no, yeah, that's fine, that's fair. I'm Steve Brinkman, Assistant Superintendent of Monterey County Unified. John Dominguez, Total Site, Total School Solutions. School Site Solutions, I'm sorry. There's so many. Um, the, uh, a little bit about our district. First of all, um, the district is nestled between Salinas on the south and Gilroy on the north. On the west side of Highway 101, it's a low wealth district, 70 to 80 percent free and reduced lunches, and has uh, six schools, four elementary schools, one middle school, a high school, and a continuation school. Um, the central issue here, as Ms. Silverman indicated, is labor compliance. Um, I've been with the district a little less than three months, but I feel like I've spent a good bit of that time working on this issue forensically. I've spoken with the personnel that were involved at the time, and they really thought that they were doing labor compliance. Uh, my predecessor I spoke with, and uh, she indicated, we did labor compliance, we did all of the things, and I said, well, you need a state-recognized plan, and you didn't have that. This district was not, clearly not, trying to skirt the labor compliance issue. It had done labor compliance with a third-party provider on other projects in the past, and it even started this project with that particular provider, but that provider's plan was under review, and there was uncertainty, and they didn't um, uh, apply, they couldn't get a uh, plan approved by the state for the district, so they went on without it. That was ill-advised, it was the wrong thing to do, and that's not in dispute at all. But um, there uh, was no, uh, no uh, evidence whatsoever that the district tried to skirt labor compliance. And in fact, we've got letters from trade unions in the area that are supportive of, of the position on the appeal. So um, I think that's uh, very important as you consider this process. Just just a question, and, and the reason I'm probing here is we do have districts come up and, and have this issue. And I'm wondering, sometimes it's a so complicated type of event that maybe the training's not well, or do you think it's just someone lower in the staff didn't watch it? Because this is a you know critical point of where we can actually, by law, bring funds out. And like we're saying, there's not that much more, you know, hide the football here, move the cans around. And I'm wondering, is there anything proactively that you think our board can direct as far as training, education, re-auditing, something at that point? Is there something wrong with the process, or is this kind of a normally and I guess that's a broader question maybe to everyone who serves this because we can't keep fixing problems because we just don't have that many tools to fix it with. At the same time, none of these cases I've seen so far are really you know, trying to do something that's illegal or to do something that's wrong. they just not fully following the rules. And we see this a lot with the change of rules that the legislature puts down all the time and different bond sources. And is it so complicated we can't get it right? Is there something we can put out a little better? And it was filling it up for more of a proactive versus a reactive type of thing for the future. I can probably only speak to this district. I, I don't know about other districts, but I've, I've had experience with this in the past. And um, it, as near as I can tell, it was just naivete on, on the part of the district. They signed, uh, two of the personnel signed affidavits that were involved indicating that they did all of the activities of labor compliance. And, and again, I pointed out that you still have to have a state approved plan, and they didn't. And, and we brought this fact forward during the uh, uh, process of applying for funds release. 
So, uh, I mean, we were straight up about it. Uh, unfortunate mistake, intent to in any way skirt laws, I haven't found any evidence of that whatsoever. That wasn't the case, and in fact, they felt like they did labor compliance, of course, absent the plan. Mr. Cameron. And I, I don't think any district we've dealt with has ever intended to skirt laws in terms of labor compliance. At the same time, I think all of us agree that, um, you know, one of the reasons we have the, the compliance laws is because we're all trying to deal with an underground economy and make sure that all of our, all of our contractors, you know, play by the same rules. And if you don't have labor compliance, then it's very easy for someone to come in and, you know, pay a bunch of guys five dollars an hour to do some work or whatever and you know if they get injured they go to our hospital you know you go and they're not paying for health insurance or anything else and so it creates a very unequal playing field and that's why we have the labor compliance laws and you know I'm, I, I'm not sure that you know on, on the one hand we opened a can of worms a long time ago and, and every time we approve these we say you know districts have to understand that we're running out of bond authority and we're not going to be able to keep switching it. And, and so and we're at that point today. I mean, if you get any money, you're probably the very last district to do that. But one of the things that strikes me in your scenario is when you go through the dates, and, and we talked a little bit yesterday, is that you weren't such a small district that this is the first program you had and you had no experience with labor compliance. In fact, labor compliance, really, the way it's set up, is not a complicated thing to do. You go out and you hire a firm that's responsible for your labor compliance programs, and that firm has to be certified by DA, DIR that it, it um, is, is, um, can, can, go, can actually do that program. And you would work with Harris and Associates, whatever this firm, in the past, and when you look at the timeline and the backup that was given here, you were notified that they weren't eligible by both DIR and by Harris before you ever signed the letter that said you had a labor compliance program. And so having had the experience and being notified that they were no longer certified and then sending us a letter saying, yes, you know, we, we, we want the funds that are now available for the, through this program because you were in line for funding, you know, this money became available, you were notified that, okay, if you have a labor compliance program, we can go ahead and put you into this program and give you, you know, money sooner. You, all of that happened, and you had experience, and yet you didn't put a labor compliance program in place. So it's hard for me to believe that you didn't know what you were supposed to do or what a labor compliance, I don't know how you personally what is supposed to do, um, or that you could just have the district do it. And there's no evidence to me, even in terms of, you know, what the district did in its program, whether it actually went out and did the, the financial audits, whether it did, you know, they're, they're, how much it was on the site talking to people, whether they did surveys. I mean, there's a whole scope of activities that can be done. So, you know, where I am on this is, I think since we have a past precedent and there's money available, I could support option 1A. I can't support option 1B because I don't want to start I don't want to say cooking the books, but if we start changing projects from fund to fund to fund every time an exception comes up, I think you're opening, we're, we're going beyond the, the slippery slope we knew we were on, and we're going to a position where when something comes up and it's not labor compliance but something else, but you want to switch funds because you know there's a, a type of project that's covered under one bond that's not covered for another, then do I go to your school district and say, well, we use, you know, switch funding, funding sources. And I, don't, I, I, I applaud the staff for all that they went through to get us to where we are today and for even bringing up 1B, but I just don't think that's where we want to go, the kind of precedent we want to set for, for future programs. So, you know, I can support 1A because of the precedent that we've done before. Um, but that puts us out of funds, which means the next person that comes to a district, and there will be another district, it means we're, we're done. So, um, I would concur with those comments, and if that was a motion, I'd second it. Um, I yeah. move we support option 1A. Yeah. So I would I would second that. I um, 
concur with all of your points. I also am a little bit worried in terms of the remaining $400,000 that we have found in the last 24 hours or whatever. Um, because, yes, they say they're LCP compliant, um, but, but, but so did this district, <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, you know, that's not a, you know, a, a firm um, verification, I think, um, in some sense. And I guess uh, I would like to even add on to the motion, if the maker of the motion um, is acceptable, uh, is that we make loud and clear a strong statement um, that this is it. You know, uh, we are now out of uh, 1D money. Um, we, that means that uh, labor compliance is absolutely mandatory and we expect labor compliance. That's what the voters voted on. They're expecting labor compliance and that we make it absolutely 100% clear from this point forward, um, so and all the districts are aware of that, that this is it. Um, if you don't have labor compliance as you are required to do in order to get these funds, then no funds. Uh, I would say I don't, I don't think we ought to add it onto the motion, but I do think we could certainly direct staff to send a letter to um, school districts that have uh, remaining projects uh, under the what, 47 and 55 and um, and let them know that uh, there is no you know no option left. I think if you look at the transcripts when this issue has come up, we've always said that our ability to do this is diminished every time we approve something. So, uh, any additional comments? I just I just want to commend the staff for looking for resources, trying to find alternatives. Oftentimes, OPSC staff doesn't get credit for looking at alternatives to solve issues. And this is one time when they went and looked under the drawers, looked under the table, looked under the bed and tried to find some money. But I, I understand Ms. McKenna's point. I, I think that's a fair uh, approach in looking at resources. My concern was also that those folks would give up those funds. Now we'll be here later and that was assured by stuff that would not be the case, but we do have a motion that's been second. Any additional comments from public? Okay. And what, Mr. Question. Is if we approve this motion as is option 1A, and all of a sudden we have a backfill of 1A or 1B coming in, or do you project any of that? Does that close this door permanently for that? Or is it something that if someone fails to use all the money or fail to do the project, because we do have those few in the 18-month deals, I don't know what's on the left on that. Is that possible for the school district to come back and try to finish this, or? <laughs> We haven't been um, alerted of any issues of those potential projects um, that are going set to expire on Friday. So no one at this point in time has shared that with us. It, it is Friday, is that the? Friday is the deadline. <laughs> so it's probably not a lot of hope at this point. Okay, thank you. So then uh, there's been moved and second that we do 1A. Uh, call the roll on that one. Uh, Bramley? Uh, Buchanan? Hagman? Almanza? Yes. Moore? Davi? Reyes? Aye. Thank Reyes. you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we really want to express our appreciation to the staff at OPSC. They just went above and beyond and they were completely supportive and mm -hmm. professional and cooperative during the whole process and we really appreciate that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, tab 14 was done. Tab 15 was done. Tab 16. And before Barbara starts, I think this is going to be the last hearing for you. Is that what you were telling me? Yeah. Were you teasing me? No, she is. She, she's going to go out uh, for maternity leave for a few days. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Three weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so tab 16, we have an item to uh, address a component of the Oakland Military Institute's consent uh, shell that went forward earlier. I move to approve. 
Any questions? How much slower this is going to go when you go on maternity leave? <laughs> Any comments from the public? Hearing none, without objection, can we go with unanimous? Thank you. Reports? Cap 17. Cap 17. Actually, 18. Apologize. Do you want to oh, tab 18? Uh, legislative. This is just our annual legislative update. It's information only for the board and all the bills that have been recently chaptered that may impact programs administered by the board. We have some very preliminary comments on the uh, potential implementation plan. This is just for informational purposes. Okay. There is a piece of legislation that was uh, implemented, AB 436. And I would like, without, uh, with the board's approval, to uh, direct Mr. Savage to take on that as one of the first things that he does with the Implementation Committee. Uh, I know that Senator Lowenthal, last time we spoke, he wanted the, uh, you to be involved on the accounting issues, and you'll be having meetings with him. But, you know, you're going to get the Implementation Committee geared up. And one of the things that Senator Lowenthal and I discussed was that it would be good if we as a board direct him on issues for the implementation committee and any board member can pull on him for data or research issues or whatnot but in terms of the direction of the implementation committee that the direction be provided by the board and so with that in mind without objection i'd like to ask bill to move forward with that and there'll be other assignments forthcoming and the hearings to come so thank you what's more um, there are two other bills on this list that indicate that um, OPSC is developing the plan for implementation, AB 677 and SB 128. Do you, can we also have those um, follow for um, discussion at the implementation committee to come forward with their plan to the board? I would assume their January 1st implementation but we have the high performance stuff. We've done a lot of work on that already, aren't we? Isn't it one of the reports? Yeah. So that's already here. No, they. You have. We have to take action to implement this legislation. We're correct? reviewing um, what potential action is required for AB 436. Is one of the things that we're currently reviewing. At this point, we don't have the a full plan. But no, no. But Ms. Moore is referring to the bills SB 70 and SB 128. With SB 128. I mean, 6-7. <laughs> Is this the appropriate time to give additional tasks to the implementation committee? That's really what the question is, Ms. Moore. Yeah, and I, it sounds like the priority is the first legislation that you indicated, but it's been historical that the implementation committee um, provides um, the recommendations for implementing of legislation and it seems there's two other bills on here that require that I'm assuming they have a January 1st implementation date with normal like normal legislation so we would want to um, move those into the queue as soon as possible too particular I'm particularly interested in in SB 128 because it will I think enhance the modernization program um, and I think it's important that we implement it as 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 soon as we can. Yeah, and it's one of them, again. It's one of the ones that we're looking at as well to see what kind of a plan we need to do and whether so we we could include that. As, so let's do that as a board. Include that into the implementation committee. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Moore. That makes sense. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Without objection, for the board. That okay. Thank you. Next item. basically given the board an update on the uh, joint use projects that were funded back in October 2010. There were five projects that did, actually did receive cash awards and they had 18 months to come in. Um, most of the projects at that point in time said they would come in as soon as they could, uh, possibly can. And then um, to date we have four projects that did come in. We still have one outstanding that's Merced Union High. And our understanding is they're working out some renegotiation process um, which continues at the local level and they assure us that they will be in before the April deadline. Okay, thank you. Next tab. Tab 20 is our workload report. Um, our workload report does reflect a December 7th date, and that will stand as December 14th. Well, we correct and that we, December 14th, right. good. And we will have the Attorney General present to 
speak to Bagley King, and we will also have um, apportionments to provide at that board date as well. So, Ms. Moore, I'm sorry, you. So I, there, we've had some discussions on when that meeting is, so it's set for the 14th. We're going to move forward with the 14th. And is that a 2 o'clock meeting? I assume it would be a 2 o'clock, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And there was, there was no date that we could get everybody, just so people know that we're not picking on you, that that's a day that didn't work for you. There was some days when we can have six people. <laughs> so just remember, that's the day we're going to approve a lot of money, so be nice to you. Um, just, um, okay. And then the, the three-month workload will then reflect the items that were put off. That's and, correct. And just, so, just for public disclosure here, the Sentinel that may come up with an alternative that was not in the list, and that's part of the reason why it got pulled. So. And that will be in January. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next tab. Other than the date, I think we're done. Just information. Okay. Ms. Brown. Yeah, before we adjourn, because it sounds like we're heading that way, I just wanted to follow up back to the item. Um, the Monterey item that we were discussing and the conversation about informing school districts from this mm -hmm. point forward, if that's something, a direction that we were going to follow through on. Yes, I think the, the, the decision or the recommendation was that the... Direct staff to prepare a letter to all districts notifying yeah. them. Thank you. And if there's like a, a forum, like in a web page or something, I don't know what's appropriate. I mean, there are a lot of folks here who follow this issue and are here can hear it now and they've heard it before I mean I don't know how to most you know be more vocal we uh, amplify the information that we're there um, okay thank you any public comments on any issues I guess we're adjourned if this is not the quickest we have been in a while <laughs> thank you everybody you can get an earlier flight <laughs>